So we are today going to be meeting Phil Jackson, the, the King of Memberships. And um, I'm sure he's going to be really insightful and feels an absolute dream anyway to talk to. So I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting interview. And I will pass over now and um, I'll see you on the other side. Hello, Phil. So welcome to the Inspiring Salon Professionals podcast. I'm so glad to have you on. And um, and it's really nice to be back and have you, um, someone I've known for ages, um, be my first guest back. Well, so, thank you for having me. And I'm trying not to take it too personally that I wasn't in season one. I know. Well, <laughs> that was all about career pathways and stuff. And it and it's really hard because you were on you've been on my list from the beginning. But um yeah. She you says, were, she, she says. says. <laughs> No, it's great Honestly, to be here. Honestly, I'll show great you my workings of who I was on there, who was on there first. <laughs> now you were you were in, in my in my top guest list. Um, but it was, it's just it's really weird when you do these things because it's kind of it kind of starts evolving and you go down pathways that you don't think you're gonna end up going down. And so this time after my little gap away, it's kind of time to start looking at how we can make our businesses better rather than looking at careers and entry levels into the into our industry. Super. And it's quite nice to have someone hair based as well, because I was very, it was all very beauty based people last time. And obviously the industry extends beyond nails and beauty into hair. It does. Um, it does. The um, And the hair guys, I'm pleased to see they're getting to grips with some of the business stuff because they've yeah. been hiding for years behind being so creative. You see that they haven't had to worry about the business stuff, but they're, they're, getting, is, they're getting there now. They're this is the problem, now. isn't it? I think. And it's a, it's a huge, huge issue that, you know, we come into into our respective sectors of the industry to be creative or to make people feel better or whatever it is that niche that you're in. And, and actually understanding how our business functions is really one of the last things. We don't get taught it at college properly. Oh, and, uh, now, now you've got me on a soapbox already. You see, <laughs> that's my biggest gripe with the qualifications is that we yeah. don't teach any business skills at all. And I find that very, very strange. No, beyond oh. kind of, like, I, think, I think when I was at college, we got a little bit on retail, mm. but it was really, yeah. But that was just like how to sell retail. And it wasn't that great because I still came up with no confidence in selling retail. Sure. And uh, and it's difficult, isn't it? You know, and there's only so much they can cram into the curriculum. And, um, there and is, it's a bit like think... schools, isn't it? You know, we, we need to have that basic life function, business function stuff spoon fed to us. And, um, and unfortunately, it's missing. It is. And I think the danger then is that we start relying on manufacturers for the education. And of course, they've got their own agenda. Yeah. Um, and... I've always tried to make it really clear with my coaching clients that your manufacturers are your competition. They are competing for your profit margin. Yeah. And um, much as they would love to see you thrive, really their number one priority has to be to shift more product because they've got shareholders yeah. to serve first before they Absolutely. look at salon owners. And especially in hair, you know, the in, in hair, the product companies are huge. You know, you look at Weller and L'Oreal, you mm -hmm. know, they're international, huge publicly owned companies. And, um, you know, in, in beauty, it's probably less so. I mean, obviously, we still have, you know, brands like OPI um, and like Clarins and those that, you know, will serve the consumer. And sure. a lot of brands that start in salon and then all of a sudden they're on QVC. <laughs> Oh, you know, well, that always used to be my gripe when we were a Weller salon, of course, was that the professional division paid for all the research and development. And then all yeah. of that technology got put into consumer products. And it's so hard. We, we could go on all day, couldn't we? <laughs> We probably will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, but the thing, but I love these conversations because the thing is, is that those of us that have been in industry for a long time, you know, we've all seen those brands evolve and mm. develop, and you know, and and literally, we are as professionals, we're used to create their name. Sure. Yeah. And that and that's the deal that we make with them. Absolutely. And unfortunately, some of the perhaps less experienced salon owners and professionals don't understand that that's the way that it works we're part of their profit margin exactly and I think it's also something that's kind of presented to us as a as a given that will retail at all and yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with the business model that says actually I'm opting out of that I'm not doing that yeah I'm going to make it part of my salon business and in fact something that I stand for that we will yeah. recommend what's right for you not what manufacturers we tend to to have yeah. on the shelves in reception and that's, that's got to be okay too but it's yeah. not presented as an alternative 
No, indeed not. If I have to excuse, I'm going to hear my, my dogs walking up and down my corridor. This is going to be a new feature of the podcast. Is like, dog, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where's Sue's dogs? Oh, there goes another one. Yeah. <laughs> can you, I don't know if you can hear. I can't hear it. No. Can you not hear it? No, you're all good. <laughs> they just try, we've got a hardwood um, corridor and they're just like pitter pattering up the corridor. Um, anyway, so what we, we are here today to talk about um, memberships and oh now they're going to start fighting um we're just gonna to have to ignore them yeah so we're here today really to talk about your big thing that you do which is memberships and mm-hmm. to explain a little bit about who you are what you do and all that kind of stuff so mm. um although we have kind of already started the conversation mm. if you would like to just explain for anyone that doesn't know who you are because there mm-hmm. may be some people feel that don't know who you are um just explain who you are and a bit about your background and what brought you to um, be the wonderful business coach that you are and what it is that you specialize in. So I've been coaching for six years. I've been in the salon industry since, believe it or not, 1999, I came into the industry. A couple of years more than me. I just, anything that happened in the last century makes me feel dreadfully old, but um, I always say Mr. Botox and Miss Peel are keeping the age age (laughs) at bay, and that's fine. I'm all good with that. Um, And I came into the salon industry the long way. I've been through university, got my degree um, in banking and finance, and Mm. then discovered salons and and salons I um they kind of saved me in a long in in a in a in a very roundabout way because I've been through years of very intense um bullying all the way through school and it was only when I got into salons that I found any kind of welcome to be honest with you and it was like coming home the first time I got a job in a salon um now I can hear them (laughs) oh oh, goodness me I'm just hang on I'm gonna pause it for a second fine but uh coming to salons the long way around kind of gave me two slightly different angles on the business firstly I wasn't 16 and coming out of school I was Mm -hmm. in my 20s I needed to get a move on um and secondly, I was never scared of the money. I was never yeah. scared of the business side. I didn't have that fear of figures and pricing and all those good things. Um, and because I was making up for lost time, I'd only been in the industry two years and we opened our salon. Um, <laughs> such an arrogant little shit. But um, I suppose you need that little bit of naivety to, to make those big yeah, moves. Um, so 2001, we opened and, and we were doing all right for about 10 years. We weren't setting the industry ablaze but we were driving nice cars having nice holidays yeah um and then 2011 the wheels fell off um and that was when we adopted my eldest son yeah um and I took a big step back from the business um well it wasn't a business that was the trouble what I'd created was a job a busy job well paid job um, but it was only when I took a step back and I realized actually there wasn't a business there at all because that's a hard bit isn't it for so many of us yeah, I, I just didn't have anything in place. I, as soon as I stepped back, there was no one coaching the team. There was no one doing any marketing. There was no one looking after the day to day. I'd put I'd put nothing in place because I wasn't expecting to have that much time off. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd banked on six weeks, which would have been fine. And in the end, I was off for six months. Wow, um, that's a big difference. And yeah, and, and then we had that lovely that lovely phone call at home from the accountant and I always say if your phone if your accountant's calling you at home it's not going to be great news and she <laughs> said um you've got six months left that was six months to mm. lay the team off sell everything off find someone wow. to take the lease over on the business and, and bankrupt the business um yes. and that was when I went okay we need to we need to do some stuff and that was also where memberships came in yeah um because what I was struggling with was these enormous fluctuations in turnover um and it made it really hard to feel financially secure I never knew when it was okay to refurb I didn't know when it was okay to recruit I didn't know when it was okay to invest in training because we had these massive fluctuations all the time so my pattern was basically start the year on a level run up some overdraft pay some overdraft off run up some overdraft and it was just this cycle through the year but what drove me nuts was that we were busy it wasn't yeah. like the guys that were left there were, were sitting around. They were actually pretty much fully booked. So I just tore it apart, tore the business to pieces, looked at every report that came out of the stupid reception system, yeah. um, looked at all the bank statements, all the contracts that we had, the suppliers, and just tried to figure out what was going wrong and, and put it back together. And we didn't yeah. go bankrupt. Um, 
I'd love to say it was an overnight success, but it took <laughs> us about six months to get back to zero. Um, and then the memberships gave us the stability to, to grow. Um, and it was also what got me into coaching because I won some awards off the back of that. We got a couple of awards for innovation um, because there was no one else doing anything like it. Nice. And, um, and then I started getting phone calls from other salon owners saying, can you help me put something in place? So I built an online program and that was kind of the beginning of coaching. And I never went back full time. Yeah. And yeah, an amazing thing too, because that, you know, I, I did your program ages ago. We were talking about just before we started recording. And um, and it is, and it's a fantastic. If you if the, if you've got a salon that you can get it to work in, and you've got the support of your team members and all that kind of stuff, then I think yeah, you know, memberships, you know, to give you that, um, it is just like an even kill, isn't it? Yeah. So that you know exactly what income you've got through the year, and and obviously not every client's necessarily going to go for it. I wouldn't have thought. Um, well, they, shouldn't. they shouldn't to be honest with you and yeah. it's one of the things that people get wrong is they try and build a membership for everybody yeah. and it's, it's never going to be for everybody um no. it should be in in my head there's a continuum and at number one you've got the people that only come in when they're given a voucher or they yeah. follow you on facebook come in when you've got a special offer yeah. there's no loyalty there they're probably seeing other people in other salons too number 10 you've got your most loyal most profitable yeah. really strong clients that would crawl over hot coals before they would no show on you yeah um the problem is people try and focus a membership on their number ones and they're never going to give you that kind of loyalty no. or they try and focus it on their number tens but they're already profitable we don't want them yeah. So, so the memberships in my head are for your number sevens. They're for the people yeah. that it, it's anyone that you get in, get into the salon and you think if I could just see you a bit more regularly, mm -hmm. we could get a really good result for you. Yeah. You this know, if you it. would just come in monthly for a facial, we could get much better results. They're the ones yeah. that we try and target yeah. with the memberships. It is, and I, th I think as well is that, you know, we, we, there is that, that whole in between ground, isn't there with clients that, you know, I, I can remember years ago, um, I think it might have been Susan Routledge and she was doing this, she did this whole analogy around table legs and trying to get clients to, to try and to get your clients to build in, to be in your business for every treatment they have. Hmm. And that each, each leg of the table kind of thing just gives you a better loyal client that's going to be with you for longer because it's easier to leave you. If, you, if they've got services, I don't know, whether it be hair, beauty, whatever, if they only have a service with you, mm -hmm. um, but they have another two services with a different salon, then, you know, if you can get them to have those other two services in your salon, it's much harder for them to leave you and to go and find someone to provide the three services. It is, but I and, guess it's also the the danger then is that you've got a lot of eggs in one basket. So if a couple of those clients do leave you, mm. then the business is really going to feel the yeah. pain. Um, yeah. So actually, there is an argument for kind of spreading Ooh. that risk a little bit more and having yeah. a lot of clients having a few services yeah. with you. But really, for me, it was just about that. I, I always called it the first of the month anxiety. It was yeah. that kind of everyone's been paid at the end of the month. Yeah. Is there enough in there to make sure we've got the mm. rent and the business rates and all, on all those regular bills yeah. paid? And that was what memberships were getting past for mm -hmm. me. It was just that anxiety, knowing that I had a certain amount of cash to depend on. Um, and it was stolen from from gyms. Um, yeah, I was at a networking event and sat next to a guy who it, it, weirdly and very rarely for Newbury, it was an independent gym. So he knew the business inside out wasn't wasn't a chain or a franchise. Um, and I just got really intrigued because he could tell me with relative certainty how much money he was going to make next month and in three months time, give or take a few cancellations. Yeah. You know, he could probably tell me what he was going to be making in six months time. And, uh, and that's what I was jealous of. That's what I wanted yeah. to get. It is because that's, that's such a stable business, isn't it? And that and also, I suppose, with you know, with the memberships comes that thing of people are reluctant to cancel because mm. of what they're going to miss and that they yeah. want to get to the end. They want to get at least to the end of what they've signed up for. So, you know, that you have a captive audience effectively. Yeah, there's there's sort of two points that you've hit on there. Um, the first is we really appreciate that when teams change. Mm. Um, so we find if a stylist or a therapist leaves, usually the clients will see their year out on the memberships before mm -hmm. they decide to follow them. And that gives yeah. you an opportunity as the business owner then to get them in with somebody else, build some loyalty again and hopefully keep them inside the business for longer. Um, but also what I really like with memberships is you're building brand loyalty, you're building salon loyalty, not individual loyalty. 
Um, and I encourage people that have memberships to share those clients around and, and have them seeing other stylists mm. and therapists. Um, so it does increase the lifetime of, of each client quite considerably. Yeah. So what are the biggest reasons um, that you would consider having um, a membership in the salon? Like, so um, what, are the, what are the sort of the big, the big bonuses of having a membership in the salon? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying I don't think there's a salon on earth that shouldn't have memberships <laughs> to, to, to a greater or lesser degree. I think every salon needs that. Yeah. Um, and the big ones for me, stability of income we've already talked yeah. about, um, increased income. And that was something it took us a little while to get right. But your membership, this isn't a discount club. Yeah. Um, and your membership clients should be your most profitable. Um, they're the first to take up sold services and they're the first to take up sold retail as well. Yeah. Because they don't feel like they're paying on the day, which is yeah. actually psychologically quite uncomfortable for a client. Mm. Um, they yeah. need to feel that they are exchanging. Um, so they're very quick to take up sold services and retail. Um, on top of that, we've got that increased loyalty that we talked about, increasing the lifespan of each client. And I think at the moment, there's there's two things that I really like about it. One is I think you stand out because at yeah. the moment it's still not normal to have memberships in place. It's getting there. I am getting yeah. there. Um, <laughs> changing, the, <laughs> changing the industry one salon finally, at a time. Finally, one salon at a time. My goodness, it's grueling. Um, but uh, it does stand out in a marketplace and if you and if you launch a membership okay you might not be the only one for long but you get to be the first yeah. um, which is always really valuable and secondly at the moment more than anything I think people are ready for some predictability because as much as we're smoothing your income for your clients we're also smoothing their spend and yeah. particularly in hair we see this if you've got clients that are coming in every six or seven weeks by definition they have a very expensive month followed yeah. by a month where they spend nothing yeah well a lot of clients will sign up for a membership even if there's no financial benefit even if there's no extra benefits built in which i think there should be um just because they're then paying the same every single month it's that predictability of income again yeah. and, um, and i never see resistance from clients the clients always get it it's it's the salon owners that are resistant it's because I suppose as well, you know, because I know you can build in so much value, can't you? I mean, you can build in retail into your membership. You can build in added value services and all sorts of different things, can't you, to make it more attractive to clients? You can. I try not to put retail in anymore um, yeah. because they are ready to buy it anyway. Yeah. Um, so we don't see a lot of extra benefit for, for building retail into memberships anymore. It's not something I teach anymore. Um I, sometimes we'll have kind of a welcome pack so when they first yeah. sign up then it gets them on that retail way of thinking yeah. um, but generally we try not to include retail um, and th there is an awful lot you can do and, and sometimes they're things that will have a lot of perceived value for the client but actually mm. cost the salon very very little yeah. um, and that's the sweet spot as far as bonuses are concerned yeah it is I think they, they, there's just there's so many different varieties that you can do isn't there and mm -hmm. and so would you um, be able to you know have a membership that would be just, you know, in, a, in say, in a uh, beauty salon that would be just like a facials membership or something like that. Would that some, some that of would the work? most successful memberships yeah. that I've launched have been facial memberships. Yeah. So in my head, there, there's there's kind of two varieties of membership. We've got what I call a true membership, which is like a gym membership. Yeah. You pay and you have unlimited access to the gym. Whether you go or not is up to you. Yeah, absolutely. Be unlimited. And that works really well for most of the hair services. Uh, works really well for waxing but you wouldn't want it for something like facials or massage yeah. um, so then we have what I would class as a, a subscription which is where you pay yeah. a certain amount and you get a set number of services in exchange yeah. Um, but facial can work really really well for subscriptions yeah. and um, it keeps people on track so that they'll start the year saying right I'm going to put my needs first I'm going to prioritize my self-care I'm going to look after my skin this year and then by March life's got in the way and the kids are a nightmare and like kind of, yeah yeah exactly and, and yeah. they've kind of gone off track memberships are a really good way for keeping that frequency of visit up and keeping yeah. them in those really good habits which yeah. then of course means they're getting great results from you too and I think as well, isn't it, is that because they've already spent the money because it's gone on direct debit or, you know, the money's gone, mm -hmm. that then when they come in, that they're more open to spend because they don't feel like they're spending money when they visit. Definitely. And so you're going to you're possibly going to pick up more retail opportunities or upselling or whatever it may be. Absolutely. It's called the yeah. law of reciprocity. And if people feel like they're not giving you something in exchange, it's actually very uncomfortable. Yeah. 
I know it is weird, isn't it? Because I've, 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 when you go to, when you go to the gym, you're used to that kind of relationship, aren't you? But um, I do think that going to a salon and not paying would be really weird. <laughs> yeah, I think the gym, I don't think there is a relationship. I think that's the big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah, you don't, you go in, you get changed, you go and do Yeah, you, something you swipe and your leave. card and you might not speak to anybody the whole visit. No. In fact, I was a member of a 24-hour gym and I never actually saw anybody the whole time I was a member. Really? Of that. Yeah. Yeah, what were you doing going at two o'clock in the morning? It was about four in the morning. I used really? To oh, wow. Yeah, God, yeah. <laughs> it was great. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want anyone seeing me sweating and straining under a two kilo weight. I wanted no. to <laughs> get in there and <laughs> grunt and shout. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Oh, dear. So, um, yeah, do you, I'm just trying to say, I can't read the questions. Hang on a second. Um, do you think it does work best um, in hair? Or, or is it, do you think that anything in our sector can work? I think anything can work. Um, I'd say 80% of the memberships that I've launched now have actually been beauty. Yeah, really? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I think it can work beautifully well in hair. I think it works great on facial massage memberships are always really popular. Yeah. Um, anything to do with um, waxing definitely works yeah. really, really well. Um, I think the only things that I have struggled with memberships have been where... I've, actually I've only struggled twice once was a nail membership mm. um and it was purely because the profit margin wasn't there it was yeah. such a now it's, it's a really anyway. hard margin it is and I've I've actually taken nails out of a lot of salons over the last couple of years because those margins are so tight and, um, and I think if people aren't prepared to charge for their time mm -hmm. that's and that's the problem yeah. in fact the, the one I've just the episode I've just been recording I've just been talking about that and just that we actually have got to work out how to price ourselves better yeah, and um, absolutely. we can't Price. charge twenty five pound for a set of gels and expect to earn money out of it. No, and uh, and actually that's a big thing for memberships across the board. You've got to have the prices right first. Yeah, if you build a membership on top of wobbly pricing, it will just magnify it. Yeah, um, and then the only other time I struggled was um, it was back in the day when blow dry bars were a big thing, mm. um, and I was brought in to consult on a membership for a blow dry bar in central London. They didn't know who their clients were. They didn't take any client details. It was literally just roll up, grab a seat. Wow. Um, yeah. And I said we can't build that because there's no loyalty, and and you don't know who your clients are. Um, no. So that's probably the only times I've been beaten. Um, the only ones I'm a little bit edgy around are when we build memberships around aesthetics. We've got to be really mm -hmm. careful then. Well, um, yeah, because obviously you don't want too many needles going in your face over the course of a, a period of time, do you? And I don't think you're ever adding value if people are having services because they feel they're entitled to them. Mm. Um, you want people having services because they appreciate them, they need them, they see yeah. the value in it, not just because they feel like well, I've, you know, I've paid for three sessions. I'm going to have three sessions, yeah. whether I need them or not. I think that's a really tricky place to be. Yeah, it is. And, and aesthetics is about to be jumped on massive, like legislation wise, it's about to, to be shifting again anyway. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a difficult market, isn't it? Aesthetics, because I think you, and you rely on people's um, image perceptions so much in more I, than any other part of our industry i don't know I, I feel like i've only really got to know the salon industry as i've started to age honestly <laughs> honestly i don't think i've really appreciated you know i've been through the motions and we all say oh you know think of the impact that you're having on the client until i started getting older i don't think i really saw that yeah and, and now i get it now yeah. i understand it I, do, I think the thing is is as you age you go through you go through so many changes and your skin and your hair i mean my hair at the moment is falling out in handfuls thanks to menopause um and it isn't there's so many shifts and changes isn't there that like now you know and it isn't the wrinkles and the like i mean i'm quite i i feel quite fortunate that at 55 i don't feel that i'm and i've never had a needle near my face i just <laughs> amateur <laughs> and i'm not doing it i've i've, I've made a conscious choice that I, I i i would have to be in a very different mindset to where i am i think it's like even going gray i'm not i'm not going to start the the tint it's not happening I uh, no, the needles started early for me, um, and I am a big fan of a needle. <laughs> I know, do you know? And I, I love that people do it, and well, as long as it's within reason, I think some. I mean, some of the stuff that we see is like I, it, it, it is weirdly, weirdly um, addictive, and I always have to train a new um, Botox therapist. 
um, yeah. because they will say, well, we want it to look natural. You don't want to look frozen, do you? And I'm like, yes, well, actually, darling, yeah. we really do. If people can see me raise an eyebrow, you're not getting tipped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, I, think, I, I say it's just, it's just such a, I, for me, it's like I wouldn't have it in the, I didn't have it in the salon. I, you know, I had friends that did it and they were like, oh, go on, you know, I can, I can come and do a day in the salon. And it's like, it, it's just not me. And I, and I really respect everyone's choices to do whatever they want to their to their skin and their lips and whatever mm. but um but it's not it isn't it's not my bag and I I don't know may, maybe when I hit 60 I might suddenly go no I've got to have it done <laughs> <laughs> well my advice is start early and yeah ever, this is I mean they'll be, they'll be in depth. <laughs> although I don't I don't think I'm I don't think I'm doing too bad for my age personally I don't know I, I don't know how many filters you've got on no <laughs> oh Mr Jackson <laughs> <laughs> I have no filters. Okay. No, it's it's really it is hard, and I I know so many people. I, I I am becoming a minority, I think, of especially in our industry. I've got most of my out of industry friends don't do anything, mm. and um, but in industry, I know I'm I'm a minority of not having anything done. I um, think it's I think it's harder in hair actually because I think if you stand in front of a mirror and look into a mirror yeah. 200 times a day, I think that's really bad for yeah. your self-esteem. Yeah, probably. I've never thought about that, but it probably <laughs> is, isn't it? Mm. I, I mean, I know, I mean, I rarely go to hairdressers anyway. I've, I've had family members that have been hairdressers, so I've always been quite fortunate to not have to go mm -hmm. and sit in the salon. But um, yeah, but it is weird. I find it, I find it quite weird sitting in front of a mirror as a client. So goodness knows what it's like being the professional behind the chair all it, the time it, it can be pretty brutal and the lighting is never the most attractive in salons either because it's there to show the colors off it's not there to yeah not, not there to flatter your wrinkles and lines but um no you should visit more salons for sure it's, I know it's, it's well, a like, really interesting moved. yeah it's an interesting an interesting thing and uh and I think what's fascinating for me is you realize how right you've got it all these years yeah. because when you go to other salons you're like well I wouldn't have done it that way and I would never I know have when I do I when I do go to other salons there. I do find I do find it quite challenging especially mm. if I go to spas oh they they invariably get a, a checklist afterwards of everything I found <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but, yeah, but the, thing, and the, the thing is I think when you've had a successful business and you know how to do it correctly mm. and I think mo most of us that come out from from behind our desk or behind the chair and go into sort of like more um, coaching and, and that kind of thing. You know, usually we've we've, cut, we've done it because we've been successful in what we've been doing. And, and oh, I, I, think... I did it up so many times. And I thought perhaps. <laughs> well, I yeah, could... but you've learned, you've learned, <laughs> and you created an amazing business as a result of it. Yeah. Save some people some sleepless nights. That was why I did it. But yeah. no, you're you're right. Visiting other salons. I mean, I I'm very lucky. I get to travel around the country, go and see different salons, and uh, and usually I will while I'm in a town visiting a salon I would normally get a haircut in another salon somewhere yeah. in town and I've always told myself before I went in that I will always rebook if I'm asked and I will yeah. take whatever retail is recommended yeah and I would say with the six years I've been coaching I have never had to buy a retail product no one's ever asked it's it's odd isn't it salon I, one of the salons I did used to go to oh my goodness me the the um, the stylist I had he was I, I couldn't leave without having bought something he was mm -hmm. on it and um and I used to find it quite annoying because obviously I could go to the local salon services and buy it wholesale. <laughs> and I still end up in there going, oh no, that'd be 25 pounds. I'd be like, okay, just have that then. Because you do, if people ask you, mm. they, then generally you you feel obliged, don't you? I don't, I don't um, think it's about feeling obliged for me. I think if it's done well, yeah, I, I actually like being sold to. I think it's a really yeah. pleasurable experience when it's done properly. Yeah yeah it's so uh, it, i think yeah i've got i have got products that i don't use now though <laughs> just been um just yes, been i know because yeah, i haven't been i haven't been to that hairdressers for a really long time so I, yeah, I need <laughs> so to, I need gone to off now that. anyway i've got like yeah. last dregs of some um, argan oil somewhere that i <laughs> <laughs> so last decade oh <laughs> um, anyway yes so Anyway, mm. back to memberships. Mm. So are there any absolute no-nos? Um, I mean, I know we've kind of covered that a little bit already, but is there any, is there any points when you just say, no, that's not going to work in your business? Um, I see a lot of people overcomplicating things. Um, keep it really, really, really simple, especially if you're expecting your team to sell memberships too. Yeah. Ideally, you want to be able to describe that membership in one sentence. 
right, two yeah. two at the most. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, the, the basic level of membership in my salon is unlimited haircuts in a year. Yeah. That's it. Um, and I think that works really, really well. If you try and make it overcomplicated, bring in different services. Everyone thinks if you're if you're adding extra services to a membership, you're increasing the appeal. And actually, it's the opposite because you've got a number of people in your salon who might be interested say in facials you've got a number of people who might be interested in waxing the crossover between the two is going to be smaller not bigger yeah. um, so if you have a facial membership and say oh we'll give them some waxing as well it actually reduces the appeal of the membership over time yeah. Um, yeah. so keep it really really simple usually built around one service or a very tight group of services yeah um, I see too many people trying to build memberships around stuff that nobody wants. Yeah. Um, kind of, <laughs> Get oh, rid of that stock that you've got oh, sitting in the cupboard that you haven't God. used, all that argan oil. Oh, the, um, the hair salons are worse for this. Let's have a perming membership. Oh, that's going to go really well. Let's, we're really going to we're really going to be able to cash in on that, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so it's got to be built around stuff that people actually want. Um, and it, I said before, it's not a discount club. Yeah. I see people trying to discount it. It needs to make financial sense. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, even in my salon, we're in a nice expensive town. We are the most expensive salon in town. It still has to make financial sense for our members. Um, but it, there's other ways to increase the value without without discounting um, and get the T's and C's sorted is the other thing. You know, yeah. really do have a good think about what's going into that little membership agreement. Um, and we've got to make sure that people can get out of it, too. There's got to be a method for cancellation in there. That's really yeah. important. Because I think it is, isn't it? And I think sometimes we forget. I mean, I know I had two um, wonderful clients that were with me for a really, really long time. And both of them at different points um, caught me out because I I thought I'd got myself covered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and one of them, I ended, up, I ended up effectively doing a free service for every time she went on holiday because of how I'd written something mm -hmm. in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, up until I sold my salon, she was still getting a free now removal. <laughs> Right. every time she went on holiday <laughs> because I kind of scuppered myself and those T's and C's are yeah are very yeah. very important it's I think we swapped two haircuts for a solicitor to look after our in fact yeah. the first the first edition I stole from the gym that I was telling you about earlier I stole their yeah. T's and C's and adapted it but I did get a solicitor to look it over and it's yeah. definitely worth getting some some proper advice on um, and I think the other thing to point out which which people forget is being a member doesn't buy you preferential treatment. No, that's not true. It can buy you preferential treatment, but the usual rules apply. So it doesn't yeah. bypass the need for a skin test before a tinting service, for example. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we're not going to follow those usual protocols. And if somebody is sat in a chair or sat on the bed with you discussing something that you know is not right for them, them being yeah. a member doesn't bypass that. It's still got yeah. to come down to your consultation first. Yeah, it is. And, and, and remaining professional throughout, no matter what. You know, at the end of the day, they're still a paying customer, aren't they? Of course. And, um, and so all of their all of their um, rights still apply the same as they would um, if they were coming in and buying service by service it would still apply absolutely yeah. but uh, but also your rights as the professional to be able to say no that's not right for you I'm not going to yeah. do it yeah um, and, that, and that's got to be in place too you've got to have that strength of character around you um, but it's I, I think it, it's making it sound something big and difficult and it shouldn't be just dip a toe just yeah. just put a membership out there maybe for 10 people just yeah. try it you'll make the mistakes on that first one and then you can let it organically grow yeah. um and actually dipping a toe makes it really easy to sell as well if you can say i've only got 10 of these memberships available yeah. they'll sell absolutely like that. and is it is it something that you could have you know so you could in a salon you could have multiple i mean obviously we're talking about subscription or unlimited hmm. but is there sort of a way that you can build in you know to have sort of like three or four different types of membership in your business yeah does that, um, does that work it does what we got wrong and i'm still undoing now is we had tiered memberships uh -huh. so we have unlimited haircuts then the next level is unlimited haircut unlimited hair color then you can add on unlimited blow dries and so on so it goes up in tiers i wouldn't do that next time yeah um it's going to be you can have a hair cutting membership and there's a color one maybe you get a discount if you sign up for both yeah but but they're not kind of intrinsically linked because what we found was a lot of people because they hadn't come across this way of spending before they're taking the basic level of membership and then two or three months in they're saying oh i wish i'd gone for the color one now yeah and then we have to stop one membership and start another well, one or upgrade this it, it gets really messy um yeah. so i'd keep each one quite distinct but yeah it's not unusual i've got ladies who are running memberships they've got five or six running in their in their salons yeah. um i think that's a lot that's a lot of yeah. acne but um, yeah absolutely have two or three 
Yeah, you could employ a member of staff just to run your membership. You could do, or to be honest with you, once they, I mean, we're really lucky. Most of our members are on the same calendar because we've all yeah. got limited numbers. So usually September, October, November is when we're selling memberships. By the end of November, it's done. We haven't got to worry yeah. about that until next year now. Wonderful. And then you know that you've got that set income coming in every month um, yeah. for the rest of the year. Absolutely. Yeah, those peaks and troughs, because it is when I mean, we were talking, weren't we, before about the peaks and troughs of um, of our industry yeah, and how, you know, and the, having a membership literally irons all of that out. So, you know, that even though, you know, you're going to have a set number of clients only on that membership, mm-hmm. that that set number of clients is there to pay your rent and to pay your overheads. Yeah. Um, and then anything over and above that is not about not necessarily a bonus, but is is there to kind of help keep the business afloat all the way through. That was that was the first flag in the ground that I put for memberships was all of the fixed costs paid. So that yeah. was a fixed part of all my wages, the rent, business rates, all the utilities covered. Yeah. Um, and ours all came in on direct debit first of the month. So that was all yeah. paid on the first of the month. And that was my first big win in memberships. Yeah. And so just think of like functionality of you, like you saying direct debits. And is that mm. something that's quite easy to set up with the bank and so on? Yeah. So you normally use a third party. The one I used to use is called GoCardless. Um, and it's really easy to set up. Yeah. And the nice thing with GoCardless is you don't handle any of the details. Yeah. So you, you send a blank mandate electronically to your client. They fill it out with their bank details. You don't deal with any of that stuff, which is yeah. great for GDPR and so on. Yeah, um, absolutely. And the only reason we came away from um, from GoCardless and direct debit was there's a window where people can't sign up. So if you've got all of your payments coming in on the first, you can't set up a direct debit on the 30th. It won't process in time um so then it was kind of okay do you want to make the first payment in the salon now and then we'll do an 11 month member it got messy mm-hmm. um so now we're on uh, stripe so instead of a direct debit it's a recurring card transaction oh yeah absolutely um, it means they can sign up any point during the month they all have their own anniversary so actually most of ours come in on the first but they are spread through the month now yeah. um and stripe have made that really easy now you can um set up a checkout on stripe pretty easily just send the client the link they yeah. type their details in and you're good to go so there's no reason not to have memberships is there really is the answer? definitely not definitely not i can think of lots of reasons to uh to have memberships i can't think of many not to have memberships no. at all it is I, th- it's, it's, I mean really it's a bit it is just a no-brainer isn't it because mm-hmm. you know to give yourself that that foundation income that's going to cover you especially with you know the recession and cost of business that we've got at the moment um you know and obviously cost of business has no price cap that um on, that's, I, don't, that's I haven't it. I think well I've been on holiday so I don't know if I've missed anything while I've been away but I don't believe there's been the massive um impact made thus far on the cost of business and price caps with I um no we, we've all we've all been burying the queen so we've had no time to talk yeah about I know I know this is it isn't it it's, it's kind of thrown everything but um yeah love her majesty but um but it, yeah, but we have got a, a big problem coming, haven't we? And I think if we if we can get something in place that that kind of underpins our businesses slightly, memberships is a way of doing that at this point. I think so, and I think it's uh, what's happened over the last few years is we've seen an acceleration in something that I've been talking about for a long time, and I think there's a polarization in our industry. I think you've either got to deliver a really high end experience, which is memorable for the client with those amazing standards, or you've got to be cheap and cheerful, grab a seat, we'll see you when we can. Um, That middle ground is way too crowded. There are still, though I hate to say it, there are still too many salon businesses, particularly in the UK. Um, Some of them need to, there there needs to be a market correction and some of them will fail, Um, but it's the middle ground that's getting squeezed. And I've always known which end of that continuum I want to be it's more fun yeah. to be at the top end you get to have Absolutely. the nice products in the salon you get to have the best cup of coffee you get to invest in training and all those great things yeah um so what we're seeing I think is an acceleration towards that and once we get our salons to that top end we have less price sensitive clients so we yeah. can weather the storms a lot better plus there's extra profit margin to help you through is I, th- I do think you know with there's there's it's a really double-edged sword isn't it so like some of the social media and the reality tv stuff has kind of made it in in my view we seem to have become it's an entitled thing to have your nails done have your face done or have you whatever whatever it is that makes you become like that reality tv star or whatever you see on social media it's like an expectation and a right to have that and that means that because not everyone can afford to do it 
salons have then competed to the bottom to make that available. And that's why we now have this huge number of salons that are not necessarily providing the best services. I think um, it's also an, a real lack of creativity in a lot mm. of salons in the way that they compete, because yeah. what you're describing on what you're describing is competition on price. And that's all I ever see. Mm. No one's ever competing on experience. No one's ever competing no. on any of the other stuff. It's just no. who, who can go to the bottom of the bottom of the ladder, um, which is a really dangerous thing to do. And I think where we got the messaging wrong um, is, was as actually as we came out of lockdown because we we've always pitched our services as essential you know mm. it's essential that you keep this up it's essential that you have the maintenance our clients have been without us for so long that we couldn't sell that as essential anymore they knew bloody but well no. it wasn't essential no. um, and yet the marketing message didn't change in salons and we missed a real beat there we missed a real opportunity yeah. when people weren't going abroad and they were looking for ways to feel better about themselves and they were looking to get into self-care and we had a real opportunity there to position what we do as much more meaningful and on a very different level mm. to that superficial um and i didn't see many salons making the most of that and i still don't which is a real shame no. but that's where we should be competing and i think and maybe and maybe that's a, a way forward isn't it you know self-care memberships you know that <laughs> maybe we can combine the two but it's it is a it's a our industry has been damaged in so many ways in the last few years and and I think we do you know I was always at the higher end of the market with my salon and and I know I lost clients over it when I put my prices up but unfortunately that's life you know mm -hmm. they say if they don't want to pay that money then they'll find a salon where they want to pay what they're charging but um, I think I think we've done ourselves. And I ourselves. had clients that wanted to pay an awful lot more than I was charging. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and you should have been letting them. I um, <laughs> I was. But I, I see where I could. <laughs> I see a lot of us just damaging ourselves. And you know, I was literally this morning having a conversation with somebody around pricing, and uh, and she'd lost a couple of clients through increasing her pricing. Fine. Um, mm -hmm. When we added it up, she hadn't lost anywhere near as much as she was going to gain by actually increasing the prices. And then it turns out she hadn't touched her prices for five years. Oh come on! So then, <laughs> this is it. So then you're paying catch. I mean, I used to, I used to try and do mine about every year, eighteen months. Um, I had some very resistant people around me that were like, "You can't, you can't," and it's like, but you know, you've got a nobody bats an eyelid when Marks and Spencers put their prices up or Aldi put their price up or whatever supermarket you choose to go to. I, I think that that's a difficult analogy to to carry through though, and I hear that touted a lot when we're talking about announcing price increases. Mm. Like Tesco's don't announce it when the price no, of milk goes up. No, but equally they don't announce it when the price goes down, which it sometimes does too. And we yes, don't have no. that in our industry. Our, no. our increases tend to be one way. Um, also, I don't think. I think as soon as you start thinking in those terms, you're assuming that people are shopping on price. And I think that's a really difficult, dangerous mm. way to run a business. So I try, I try not to lean into that supermarket analogy, but I don't think there's, um, the problem is a year, 18 months, particularly at the moment when we're seeing costs increasing so quickly, it's way too long. You can't guess what your overheads are going to be in 18 no. months time. I, well, no, especially um, not this point. So then you're With, always, uh, you're always on the back foot. So I encourage people to look at their prices every six months. Yeah. Generally, that means the increases are a lot smaller. You know, it might just be one or two pounds on things. You're not likely to lose people over one or two pounds. But right. if you wait 18 months and things have to go up 10 pounds, people yeah. are going to question that. You know, even yeah. at my end of the market, people are going to question those big jumps. So if we review them more consistently every six months, I think we can we can keep on top of things. Yeah. But to be honest with you, if, if you get rid of um, physical price cards, which should have been done ages ago by now and i hope we're not preaching to too many unconverted people on that front um you know increasing your pricing could happen every week if you wanted it to it doesn't have yeah. to be on every service but as soon as you notice something is no longer profitable just change it on your online booking they'll yeah. see the price next time they're booking in anyway um yeah. and go from there so i don't think we should be so hung up on these prices having to be around for such a long time no isn't i know um one of the last price lists that i had in my salon was literally a menu of what was available yep. with a qr code Yep. And um, and it linked directly to my website, which was the only place that was kept up to date. Perfect. But um, unfortunately, my demographic of clients were were much more mature and mm -hmm. far less technically minded. Mm -hmm. um, and QR code. I mean, that was probably about five years ago. I did that, and they were all like, "What? What is? What have I got to do?" You know, it's and it made it for them. It made it overcomplicated. So in the end, I had to get a price list back again, which was which totally defeated the object. I was ahead of the game, mm. and. Uh, 
And it I think like now, I think everybody, you know, everyone's phones automatically zaps a, a QR code and you don't yeah. need an app or anything to do it, do you now? No, but, and um, I think the um, that's the other favour that COVID did us actually is that acceleration in technology. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people and there's, now... there isn't, there's no reason, is there? You know, we, we all need to have something that looks attractive and we need mm. to work out how we um, market that to our clients but you don't necessarily have to have it in a print form any longer. No, definitely not. And, you know, when we're looking at things like virtual consultations, I think there's a massive opportunity there now because even those more mature clients, like even my mum, she's in her 80s now, she knows how to do a Zoom call. Yeah. Um, and that five years ago would have been just yeah. not on her radar at all. She never thought she would adopt that kind of technology, but no. she's had to. So there's a massive opportunity there for us to embrace technology. But innovation has always been a real struggle in our industry. I think we're great yeah. on innovation and product, but as far as the way that we carry out services concerned, yeah. I think we're so slow. This is it. But I suppose, again, you know, it takes us back to the beginning conversation that we had of, um, of colleges and business education and all of that kind of stuff isn't it and the fact that we don't get that fundamental underpinning um, technology we do you know we don't learn about online booking systems in college still you know there's there's so much missing isn't there from what we get taught I think what I see missing more than anything though is the fun I just think that somewhere along the way we forgot that actually business can be fun and if we have that slightly lighter touch with things and play with the business a little bit and you know we'll use memberships as an example but put a membership together throw it out there if nobody signs up so what the world is not going to spin out of orbit no. um you know just play with the business a little bit more have more experiments be prepared to fail a little bit more yeah. and just have that slightly joyful approach to it and I, I, that's what i see missing more than anything these days is people yeah. are really starting to hate their businesses and that's a real shame yeah definitely so talking talking of which what is it so is there anything you actually miss from being behind the chair because obviously mm. you were behind a chair as opposed to me being behind a table <laughs> I was um I, I miss the salon more than I miss the standing behind a chair being with clients mm. I miss the staff room I miss the gossip I miss trying to spot who's got the hangover on a Saturday. Yeah. I miss, I miss the, I miss the traces of last night's makeup coming in. And, yeah. You know, and or, people kind of holding who, it together. Who smells? Who smells of too much red wine this morning? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You could always spot the pros because they were on the vodka, not the tequila. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I miss that kind of thing. And I, I even miss the, the bitchiness and the backbiting. And that it's that camaraderie, though, isn't it? It is. It's kind of that that in the thick of it together. Um, I miss the hair. I just uh, what I always wish I was really good at hair extensions and I wish I'd taken that a step further and gone for wigs because then I could have done the mm. hair without the client which would have been yeah. my absolute dream um just to just to be really creative with hair and not have to do the whole but I'm, I'm actually a very um introverted person and I found that kind of social aspect of the business quite mm. tricky yeah. um so I was always much better at dealing with the facts and the figures and the business side um, I actually found it quite draining talking to people all day, every day. Mm. So I don't, I don't miss that bit. I certainly don't miss standing up for nine hours a day. No, I don't know. I, I don't know how hair, to, uh, although sat, the last time I had my hair cut, she was, she was like sat down whizzing around me on a stall. Mm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. We used to have races on those up and down the salon. <laughs> Yeah, we used to we used to have like a corridor that ran through right from the back to the front of my salon, and we mm. yeah, occasionally, occasionally, yeah, um, yeah. I I got in trouble. Someone took photos of me doing it once, and um, yeah, I was I was injured. But as a salon owner, I wasn't supposed to do that kind of thing. Perhaps okay. I well, I think next time round, take the photo yourself, get it on your Instagram yeah, page, cool. <laughs> rejoice in it, bring the joy yeah, back. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, you do. You just say you have you have to have stupidity every now and again, don't you? It's, it's it, a, um, there are much easier ways to earn what we do and I think without yeah. the joy what is the point yeah absolutely you've got to have a laugh mm -hmm. so finally mm -hmm. what is the one piece of advice that you feel young Phil um, would have benefited, benefited from younger Phil would have benefited from I think what we were talking about actually I think that kind of the joy around the business um, and I think be bold be brave mm -hmm. The, the biggest threat to your business over the last few years is nothing you could have predicted. There is nothing you could have done about it. Um, and I find that quite liberating, actually. That means that, you know, the, the biggest impact on the business was not because you forgot to do an Instagram reel yesterday or it's not because you <laughs> it's not because you cut someone's fringe too short. It wasn't any of those things. No. Um, so let's embrace the fact that we do an amazing job with high standards 
um, and, and just be a lot braver with our businesses and, and take some risks and take some chances and have some fun with it. Um, and and always sleep with younger men, I think would be my other piece of advice for anybody. I think it keeps you young. <laughs> well, that, yep. Yeah, and a, a, a wonderful. <laughs> you nearly lost the I wasn't words, expecting that one. <laughs> I should know better. <laughs> oh dear thank you so much phil it's been an absolute joy and i really hope that um that talking about all of the membership stuff and working how you can work that into your business also just one final thing do, and i take it that um you would see this working in like a home salon environment as well because obviously oh, for sure we're one of the bit massive things that's happened to this industry through um covid is that there's a huge number of home salons now, massively hmm. more than there ever was. And, and it will be interesting to see what happens over the next two or three years with that. It's, mm. it's going to go one way or the other. Yeah. Um, my, uh, I think we, we saw that huge number of home salons. I think on the back end of COVID, we're also seeing a lot of people kind of going, actually, I'm lonely and I yeah. want to be in that salon environment again and I want that team around me again. Yeah. Um, and I also think the way that the government help was handed out has made self-employment less attractive. I think the mm. self-employed were really beaten up over that. Yeah. Um, so I'll be interested to see what happens over the next two or three years. But I never used to be, bring memberships into independence. But I, what I realised was where a salon has a team behind it, there is a certain amount of stability that comes from that anyway. Mm. Um, if you're on your own, you need that more than anybody. Mm. You know, you, you need that predictability more than someone with a salon team does. Yeah. Um, yeah so, because there's only you, there's only you, can, you, you know, to rely on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we've brought memberships into all shapes and sizes of salons now. Yeah. Wonderful. OK, well, we shall stop the interview there. And okay. um, and we, yeah, hopefully also, Phil, you, I will put on, um, you'll be able to contact Phil. I'll put all of his details onto the show notes. Um, and they'll be on the website and on they'll definitely be on apple because they're the only one that does show notes um but yeah that will all be there so you can get in touch with phil if you would just like to vocalize where they can find you so that it's on here too i'm on instagram as phil jackson coach um facebook on <laughs> i'm on as phil jackson coach but don't hold your breath for a reply that will take a little longer but instagram i tend to hang out or the big hub for everything that i do is buildyoursalon.com Yep. Wonderful. Okay. And all of those details will be on the show notes. And, um, and thank you so much for spending time with me today, Phil. It's been my pleasure. What a fantastic interview that was. And thank you so much, Phil, for being so um, open about your memberships and what people can expect and, um, and how they can be utilized in your business, whether you're a home salon, mobile, whatever your setup is, it seems um, that Phil and his memberships will be able to help you maybe iron out some of the fluctuations that are going to be um, coming for all of us over the next few months whether that's um, in the sort of the winter drop down of clients um, or whether it's you know with the cost of living cost of business um, fluctuations that are going to be going on as well and maybe now is a good time to invest in Phil's training um, of how to start a membership scheme in your business so that you can get that stability of income that will help you in the coming months. Um, as Phil said, he's given you all of his um, tags that you can find him on social media and online, and all of those will be in the show notes too. I hope that you found it really interesting too, because memberships are a different way of working, and it is something that is um, not how our industry has ever really worked before. And I think Phil kind of hit upon something a few years ago when he brought memberships into his um, own business and the way that it turned around his business when he was in difficult times. And I think that that's a lesson that maybe we could all learn from and that maybe, you know, it could be something really, really simple as just, you know, a, a regular service, you know, like maybe the waxing or maybe your facials or if your hair, you know, doing the haircuts thing, the unlimited haircuts that Phil does. There's a, there's got to be a way in most businesses how you can incorporate memberships to give you some level of predictable future income, because that's what it's all about. And um, I will see you next time on Inspiring Salon Professionals. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Salon Professionals. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe, leave a review and share with fellow industry professionals that you think may enjoy the show. 
Links and further information can be found on the show notes or on my website, www.suedavies.org. Here you can also find some downloadable free guides that you may find of use. You can also hear from me and join the inspiring Salon Professionals community on my Facebook group. Thanks again and see you next time. Bye for now.